I like to call coal a memorial to Noah's flood. The evidence is consistent with rapid burial, rapid formation, rapid chemical changes, which of course is consistent with Noah's flood. When the machine stops, you stand up against the coal, you can hear it hissing. And if it was just left like that, there'd be risk of explosions. And the presence of that methane, what, what does that tell us? People think coal takes millions of years to form and that this proves the age of the earth to be very old. But Taz, you're going to tell us the opposite here, that coal doesn't need millions of years to form and can actually be evidence for a young age of the earth. You've got a PhD in engineering. You've worked in coal mines. You've managed this resource. How does coal speak to us about the age of the earth? You wouldn't think so, would you? But in fact, it does. I like to call coal a memorial to Noah's flood. That's what it in fact is. And so it's not just me saying so. What I'm going to explain, I'm going to point to the evidence. It's the evidence, that the actual characteristics, what we see, what we observe, that's what points to the fact that it happened quickly. And so there's a lot of things that I want to talk to you about, I'm going to cover with you. And so that's going to make it really, really great to see that it is in fact factual. Mm, let's dive straight in. So what are some of these evidences? Well, let's begin. One of the things is to do with the characteristics of the coal. It's underground, most people don't see it, uh, so they don't realise that sometimes the coal seams can be 100 metres thick. Incredible. And uh, when you think about just how that fits with a human being, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's a uh, 50 people standing, one on top of the other, would cover a whole coal seam. And so that's the size of it. That's one of the amazing things about the coal seams. Although sometimes you find that the coal seams are thinner, half a metre, even 10 centimetres, 30 centimetres, something like that. That's what they can be, and which creates a bit of a problem for people trying to mine them. But this great variety, this great range within the coal points to something unusual that happens. Uh, and how did that, how did they form? That's the question which points to the young age of them. And where do we see these coal seams? Can we, can we go and see them? Whereabouts are they now? Well, coal is found all over the world. You find coal in Australia. There's a number of different places in Australia. You find coal in North America, South America, in Europe, in England. And in England, where the coal was found, they call the particular geological area the Carboniferous Era, the era when coal grew. They get it mixed up because it wasn't an era. It happened quite differently from what they imagine. And uh, also you find coal that's buried deeply and you find coal that's near the surface. And again, they've got different characteristics. So coal is amazing where you find it in the world, yeah. So, but you can see them in open cut mines. But before that, people didn't really see them except those actually working in the mines. And so they didn't appreciate just what a dramatic and amazing uh, thing this is, these coal seams, and they point to rapid burial, rapid accumulation, rapid formation, rapid chemical changes, which of course is consistent with Noah's flood. That's why I call them coal, a memorial to the flood. What you find in coal is you find that, uh, of course, it's made up of vegetation. And it's interesting, you don't find just the trees, you find often just the leaves and the branches in one area, and you find the trunks of the trees in another area. Uh, also, you find it's got ferns, really nicely preserved ferns, and you find that the, the trunks of the trees have got scaly bark on them. Usually they don't have roots, and, so, uh, and there's various particular types of plants which are found in the coal. Calmonites and Lepidodendrum is one that's been named, and so we find those things in coal, and those characteristics point to the question of how did it get there how long did it take? Mm, so can you explain how, how is that a connection? Well, the problem for, for, for all of people when they discover it, mainstream geologists, is how did it get there? And they don't just come to find out how it got there. They've already got a belief in their mind about what happened in the past. And in that belief, they do not believe the Bible 
in the fact that the Bible talks about the global flood. They don't believe that. As a matter of fact, they're committed to explaining things without any sort of catastrophe. And so they try to explain things by what we see happening today. And the big problem is, where do you see huge volumes of vegetation uh, growing and accumulating today? And that's the problem that they have. And so they think, well, what sort of environment in the world do we find coal today, to find vegetation growing today? And they think, ah, the only one that really suits is a swamp. See, you can't even go to a rainforest where you get enormous uh, rapid vegetation growth. If you go there, it uh, decays away uh, as quickly as it forms. Whereas in a swamp, the idea is if we can get a swamp in which the water has got some sort of uh, acidic flavor to it without oxygen in it, then maybe the vegetation can accumulate in there without rotting away. So that's why they say it formed in a swamp. So they're trying to look at what we see today and say that that's what was happening a long time ago. There's a word for this, isn't there? There is, there is. Uh, the idea is it, it came in as, it's a belief system and a, a Scottish physician by the name of James Hutton coined the term and it was picked up by another guy called, who was a lawyer called Charles Lyell. He wrote a book about geology. And the idea is we use present processes, the present world, the present environments to explain what happened in the past. Because you see, with geology, you can't go back in time. You can't go ha back and have a look to see what happened. So it's speculation from that point of view. And so the word is uniformitarianism. Everything was uniform, compared the uniform with today. So that's the word that's used. And it's a bit of a debatable word. It's a bit of a controversial word because it doesn't really fit with the geology. And so that's, uh, that's how it works today, uniformitarianism. Okay. And so what they've come up with is this suggestion of a swamp to try and have the present as the key to the past the only thing they've been able to come up with is, is this swamp is idea. Swamp. Okay. So how do you explain 100 metres of coal with the swamp? So to accumulate it, 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 there's a lot of things that have to fit together. First of all, the swamp has to be just at the right level. It can't, the, the, the water level can't be too low, otherwise it would die wouldn't have enough to live, the plants would not live. The water level can't be too high, otherwise they'd drown. So it has to be just right. And not only that, as the, as the vegetation accumulates, uh, the, the uh, level of the water has to continue to rise, the, the water in the swamp has to continue to rise at exactly the same rate as which the vegetation accumulates. That's a very delicate balance. And when you've got lots of vegetation, that, so it has to uh, maintain that balance for, for thousands and thousands of years. And so that's why the swamp idea is a little bit of a, a stretch. It's a bit of a, a long take. There's a debate among geologists about whether the, the vegetation was washed into place or whether it grew into pl in place. There's words for it that they use. But uh, it, although it looks like it was washed into place, they can't really uh, take that as how, what happened. Because, Why not? Why won't they well, own up to the evidence? You need a flood of biblical proportions. And so that's not allowed to be included in their explanation. So that's why they go for the swamp theory. Otherwise, they would be back to a biblical uh, understanding of how coal formed. Okay. And so the way you've described all of these conditions that would need to be happening for this swamp, for, it, for the coal to form... Sounding pretty unrealistic over a long period of time, all of those perfect conditions lining up for you know, and then to stay that way. That's exactly right. But but the thing is, this philosophy, this idea, this uh, scenario is so ingrained that uh, geologists just accept it and work around it and don't really think about it too much. Mm -hmm. So the other thing about the uh, about the the coal, it it has tree trunks. Or, or, or uh, the uh, logs, you know, the trunks of trees which are in them. 
And the interesting thing is that you don't find the uh, roots that are on the trunks, that you don't find the root system. There might be some tr roots which are broken, but by and large, they're not there. And sometimes you find these trunks which sitting vertically through a coal seam and then into the, the sandstone layer, which is above it, and into the next coal seam, which is above. So these cut many strata. These tree trunks cross lots of strata, so it's called poly, many, mm. strata, polystrate fossils. Mm. And so these point to the idea that these coal seams were deposited rapidly. That's because the tree trunks are well preserved, even going right up up the column like that, right up the tree trunk. And so they're well preserved. And so indicating that they haven't been sitting vertically for, for hundreds of years or tens of years uh, and rotting away, they're buried rapidly. Mm. And, and not having a root system there, a, a clear root system, what does that mean? That means they didn't grow in place. Mm. And not only that, you don't find soil underneath the coal seams. Sometimes uh, geologists will point to little uh, flecks of, of uh, coal which sits in the layers underneath and they'll say these are, are roots. But when you look at them, they're not really roots. You know, it's just been interpreted as roots because they really need to find roots uh, and it's not that way at all. Okay. And what else do we find, Taz, when we look at the um, these seams? above and below these coal seams, what other things do we find? Well, you find that the vegetation has been buried by sedimentary deposits. So you find sand, lots of sandstone above coal, sandstone underneath the coal. You find lots of mudstone, you find mud that's there. So this vegetation has been washed into place with lots of sediment and has been buried. Uh, by the sedimentary rock. So that's where the coal seams are found. And sedimentary rock is? Sedimentary rock is, is uh, it's rock which formed out of water. <laughs> so you find, for example, you find uh, often in the, the layers of sediment above, you find evidence that the water's washed it in rapidly. You find evidence of uh, what they call cross bedding, which indicates that the water was flowing and uh, which is not the sort of thing that usually happens in, in the swamp. So we've got a scenario that they are um, sticking to and, and their swamp is the suggestion about how this formed. Is there another perspective about how coal forms? Well, there is. And uh, creation geologists point to the event, the historical event of Noah's flood. And so the evidence is consistent with that. So we, you know, creations re read the, what the Bible says, the account of uh, how the flood, you know, came on the earth, how long it took and how it went up and then how it went down. So they, they look at that. And so that's really a, a quite an amazing way of understanding the evidence. And the evidence points towards that. So we don't have a problem with a flood of biblical proportions. <laughs> That's exactly what we'd expect to find. Can you maybe take us through some of these evidences from this perspective, this biblical perspective of the flood and laying down um, these coal seams? Well, some of the evidence that it points to the fact that it was deposited quickly is we find um, the, the coal covers a wide extent uh, across the landscape. So it's not just like in a little little bog or a little swamp. It covers vast area. And that's the way mainstream geologists describe it as mm. a, a, an enormous, an enormous uh, area that was this swamp, which is unusual. You don't find swamps covering such large areas mm. today. And you find that the, so the, the, it's tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, and some of the coal mines in, in various areas, the entrances are on the land and they mine the coal and it goes underneath and underneath and right under the ocean, you know, for 100 kilometres or so to be able to mine the, the coal. So that's, that's an example of uh, the characteristic which points to a widespread lateral excursion of the coal uh, deposit. Taz, there's a few other things you've talked about when it comes to evidence of rapid burial. What are those? Can you explain? Well, one of them is methane and the other one is sharp contacts. Now, before I get onto the contacts, explain the methane. The methane 
when when geologists and miners are, are digging out the coal, they have these machines with sharp teeth and they rotate and they dig the coal out. So it's interesting. When the machine stops, the noise goes down, you stand up against the coal, you can hear it hissing like that. And the, the, it, so the methane's coming out and if it was just left like that without good ventilation, there'd be a, a big risk of explosions. As a matter of fact, in one of the coal mines that near the power station where I worked, there was an explosion while I was working there and there was something like 20 people killed. There was, a, there was a fire that started in the coal mine and they were trying to put it out. They were working underneath and then it, the methane caught a light and then it set up the fine, the fine coal dust and there was an enormous explosion and, and it just uh, a lot of people were killed. It was a very big tragedy. And the presence of that methane, what, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the uh, it hasn't been just sitting there waiting to be buried for thousands and thousands of years. It has to be buried rapidly so it traps it inside the vegetation. So that's why the methane is an indicator that it happened rapidly. Wow. Okay. And then what about sharp contacts? Explain that for us. Well, you, sometimes you find fairly thin coal seams you know, just maybe a few inches or maybe, uh, you know, 20 centimetres, 30 centimetres like that. And they've got very sharp contacts between the coal and the, 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 the rock, the sandstone or the mudstone. And these sharp contacts indicate that uh, it, it, it's not like it would be on the top of a swamp where it would be all uneven, but that's a very, very flat indicating that it was deposited laterally and, and rapidly and producing these sharp contacts. Okay, so contacts is referring to like the surface. The, the contact between the coal and the the the, uh, the different sort of material, which is the rock above it. Gotcha. What about a, another evidence? Some of the other uh, features of the coal is that it includes uh, fine bands of uh, they might be sandstone bands or, or, or mudstone bands within the coal. So these fine bands. Uh, it's, it creates a problem for being able to produce coal of good quality because you dig out the coal and it's got this fi these fine bands in it. And so it has to be washed to get these uh, this mud out of it, which is the ash. But the thing about these coal bands is that they don't show evidence that they've been inhabited by burrowing animals. So they call it bioturbation. So the absence of bioturbation indicates that it wasn't sitting there for... Uh, long periods of time and being colonised. Also, you don't find evidence of roots in these sorts of seams, these sorts of mud, mud seams. So that's another example that it happened quickly uh, and that it uh, did not follow the swamp uh, okay. scenario. So if we, so what we would expect to see if it took such a long time, over a long time, then we would see an presence of animals and all sorts of things happening. But what you're saying is we don't have that. You'd expect to see the presence not of animals, but things like worms and and things, little things which would would be in the sediment and which burrow. You, we find that when you're down the beach, for example, and the tide goes out, all the animals come out, the crabs and the worms and that, and they start burrowing around. Uh, and within a few hours, you know, it, the you see the evidence for those, and then the tide comes in and washes it all away. So mm. you'd expect to see that in in a coal seam which was over thousands of years. What about fossils? Do we see fossils in these coal seams above, below? You do find fossils in coal. Uh, you find, for example, that occasionally you find fish fossils in coal, indicating that there was some sort of marine connection with them. And uh, you find fossil shells in coal. And so, of course, you find fossil plants that's made of coal. That's what it's coal is made of, is made of plants. And so the idea that coal forms rapidly is, is it's one of the factors that affected a long age geologist by the name of Derek Ager. He was the uh, professor of geology at the University of Swansea in Wales, and he was brought up on the concept of uniformitarianism, so he believed what he was taught. And as he, as he traveled around the world and did his geology, he found it didn't fit with what he was taught. 
and coal was one major factor. Now, he pointed to these polystrate fossils in the coal, and uh, he, he mentioned that they're found in numbers of coal, you know, areas around the world. This so is the tree trunks. These are the tree trunks yep. that sit vertically. Mm. And uh, so he described these and, and the size of the coal seams and how thick they were. And he came to the conclusion, he said, it's, it, you know, it's uh, clear that in the past, sedimentation was at times very rapid indeed, which, of course, is just exactly what you'd expect from Noah's flood. It's interesting that Derek Ager, when he published on what became known as the New Catastrophism, a lot of creation geologists picked up on his books and they used his books and were really excited about the evidences that he presented. And so in his subsequent publications, he, he had to make a disclaimer saying, I want to make it very clear that my work does not support flood geology, which I don't think is a real science. Well, of course, it does support flood geology, but he just didn't want to be uh, remembered for that. Uh, but it's a very, very interesting how the evidence actually points to what you'd expect from Noah's flood, doesn't point to the idea of uniformitarianism. Mm. So Ager had decided the evidence is not pointing enough to uniformitarianism and he was changing his ideas to fit? That's right. And mm. he brought in a concept called neo-catastrophism, new, the new catastrophism. And uh, as a result of that, a lot of geologists now do, believe, do accept neo-catastrophism, which is the idea that things happen slowly, uh, generally, but then there's amazing catastrophes which occur where most of the geology occurs. And so in between these areas which happen rapidly are long periods where nothing happens. And uh, Derek Ager talked about it as it's like the life of a soldier, which is uh, long periods of boredom separated by short periods of terror. And uh, so coal is something that points to that, so it points to that's been deposited rapidly. And the only way that you can preserve the idea of uniformitarianism is to put millions of years into places where you can't see it. But this catastrophism or the neo-catastrophism would mean that those catastrophes would need to be over the whole world. That's right. That's exactly right, over the whole world. And mm. you do find them over the whole world. And that's one of the things that uh, Derek Ager talked about. He talked about the lateral extent of the different types of rocks. He called it the lateral extent of facies, which means different types of rock. And so we see that with coal, how coal extends for long, long distances. And other types of rock do the same thing, which is exactly what you'd expect from Noah's flood, which was a continent enveloping catastrophe which occurred in the past. And it was only some four and a half thousand years ago when it took place. Mm, so he's describing the flood, but saying it wasn't the flood. That's right. He's yeah. describing the evidence for the flood, but not wanting to admit that it was the flood, Noah's flood. Taz, can you paint a bit of a picture for us if um, if the flood was the reason um, that we have the geological landscapes today? What what happened in the flood that would have created these things and, and, and the aftermath of that to form these coal seams all over the place? Well, it's an enormous catastrophe. And so we have to picture in our mind what life was like before the flood. There were continents before the flood before Noah's flood, but they're not the same continents as today because the continents of today are covered in sedimentary rock, which was laid down by the flood. So these continents existed and perhaps they, perhaps the ocean basins of today uh, is where the continents existed before the flood. That's one idea that's been floated. And uh, so these continents, people lived on them, there was vegetation on them, there were forests and uh, lots of plants and that sort of thing. So the flood actually destroyed this pre-flood world and the vegetation was ripped up and it would have been carried across long distances by the water, flowing water really rapidly, vegetation floating on the water and being turbulent, mixed up, and then the, uh, the, the sediment burying it, burying it rapidly. And we see that happening, you know, what happened there. And um, a lot of people think that it would have taken 
long periods of time to actually form the coal. But it's very amazing that coal can form quickly. So you have the vegetation, which is buried. And even in the garden, when we have lots of vegetation, it doesn't take long for it to become warm, you know, the vegetation. But uh, in the in the time of the flood, it was buried. And if you heat vegetation, it becomes warm and it, it chemically changes. So what, what happens is that um, experiments have been done. They take a... Um, a pressure vessel, something that's strong and can withstand pressure, put something like wood in it with some water and also with some sort of a catalyst, maybe like clay or ash, and you heat it. Now, the amazing thing is it doesn't take much heat. Uh, 150 degrees, which is a, a low heat in an oven, isn't it? I don't think it's, I wouldn't like to put my hand in, but it's a low heat, 150 degrees, and within just a few weeks, within a month or two, the wood turns into brown coal. If you turn the temperature up a bit more, 200 degrees, 300 degrees, what happens is it drives off the volatiles out of the vegetation, and so you've got the uh, the liquids, and it forms gases and, and liquids, and this produces the oil and the gas which we uh, use today. And uh, so, and the, and the coal that's remaining, the vegetation that's remaining, becomes black, becomes black coal, or even when the when the um, when the volatiles have gone, it becomes stuff like anthracite. And how long is this roughly sort of taken? Well, it happens just within weeks and months. That's all it takes. It's a chemical reaction. And uh, even during the war, when, pe when the countries were sort of needing oil and those sorts of things, they had factories and, and chemical plants which were able to produce these things quite rapidly. And so... It, it doesn't take millions of years to form coal. It can happen very no, rapidly. No, clearly we're able to set up experiments. We're able to, with the right conditions, as you said, do it quite quickly, That's not right. millions of years at all. That's right. And um, so the, the, the vegetation was buried during the flood. So um, early in the flood, when the, when the vegetation was buried, there's, it, it formed a lot of stuff like black coal because it's buried. There's a lot of volcanic activity which occurred at that time okay, as so well. Okay, so that's providing the heat. That's providing the heat. Mm -hmm. And so that's common to have uh, the coal measures to include volcanic ash. And then as the floodwaters peaked and as they started to come down, it then buried lots of other vegetation uh, in the receding floodwaters. And that forms stuff like um, brown coal. So the brown coal mines in Australia... They're, 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 again, very thick deposits of vegetation, lots of tree trunks, and uh, it, 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 it's very difficult to burn in a power station because it's not got lots of energy and there's a, a lot of ash mixed in with that, but uh, not like in the earlier ones. So that's how it formed during the flood. It depends on different times when it was buried, different amounts of heat and uh, different amounts of cover. Uh, which would produce the different sorts of coal. Mm. And so it was indeed an incredible catastrophe. And I always like to think that while all this was going on, that uh, there were some people on this big boat, Noah on the ark, uh, with, the, with the eight people and the animals, and they were sort of present as the waters went up and as the, uh, the, the, the vegetation was buried and then they're sitting on the mountains of Ararat as the waters were going down and producing the, uh, the brown coal, covering the brown coal and the lignite, which is found in so many places around the world. I like to think of the word kind of cargo ship instead of boat because sometimes <laughs> I guess the picture that people can have in their heads, Noah and um, his family on a boat can seem a bit small, but the idea that um, when you look at the feasibility studies, it would have fitted everything very well and been quite a comfortable ride in that setting of so much turbulence on the water as That's well. That's right. The ark was very stable. It was very mm. large, larger than a foot, longer than a football field mm. and uh, 15,000 tonnes capacity, very, very big, very, very big uh, vessel. And vessel, uh, that's a good word. Vessel, yeah. plenty able to, to hold all the animals and that. But that's when the coal was forming during Noah's flood as the waters were rising. It's great when I get the opportunity to take people around and have a look at the rocks. I do these geological excursions and people come around and I show them the evidence 
how it points to the biblical flood. And coal is a a, a really highlight for people. Really? There's, what does it look like? Well, what's it look like? What I've described, but uh, you don't normally see it. Coal's underground usually, and there's a particular location in an industrial estate where they've cut a great big uh, embankment. And in that embankment, there's this enormous seam of coal. And uh, you can, and people will just stand there looking at the layers of it. They're incre- incredibly just astounded by the thickness of it. And, uh, and it just points to them. I've often had people explain to me and say, that was just such an amazing thing when you took me at the back of those big sheds and had a look at the coal. And so when they're looking at it, how, how do they visually see an example of or evidence for um, rapid burial in a flood as opposed to this swamp idea that most geologists are, are giving us? Yeah, well, you can see the clear layers. That's, the, that's one of the things. And it's got little bands of uh, sediment and, and, and rock between them, stone between them. So that's clear. That's there. And you don't see the evidence of uh, like um, peat and that sort of thing, which is, which is in the coal. So a swamp idea wouldn't give you layers? Well, not really, not really. You, you um, expect peat is formed in great big thick piles of uh, of vegetation which rots away and so it, it doesn't give the layers like that and it doesn't have the wide geographical extent that uh, we see in the coal layers. So there's quite different, mm. which is, and uh, but still it's the best thing <laughs> that geologists, they say, try to piece together modern processes that's what they try to make it into a story, make it into a scenario. Mm. Yeah, you've taken us through the picture that a geologist paints with this swamp idea and then how the evidence actually fits so much better with a global catastrophe, flood. It's amazing that so many people still hold to the idea that coal takes millions of years to form and Otherwise, you'd have to have a flood of biblical proportions. And the whole philosophy is such, no, it's not allowed. That is not allowed. And so they go with something. And the idea is that eventually we'll solve it, but we haven't solved it yet. Hmm. So I wrote a, uh, an article called Coal, a Memorial to the Flood. And it was about the brown coal, which is in the south of Australia. And that was very, very popular, but it is a memorial to the flood. And I had lots of people found that was very, very helpful to see how it fits together. So, Taz, what what can we take from this amazing message about coal? Well, coal points to the biblical truth, points to the reality of the biblical events. And uh, when you point to that, it points to catastrophe, it points to destruction, it points to burial, which is indicates that we live in a fallen world, in a broken world. And again, so that gives us hope because the Bible reveals that that's why Christ came. He came to redeem this world. And uh, it's a broken world. It's a, it's a world that is going to be one time turned into a new heaven and a new earth. And so that's really a very, very positive thing that comes out of coal, Memorial to the Flood. Thank you, Taz, so much for sharing about this stuff. Ah, it's a great pleasure.